watching this webinar from, so welcome. I'd just like to say that on behalf of the National Child Passenger Safety Board, thank you for joining us for booster seats and belt fit, recent research findings from volunteer studies and sled testing. During this webinar, CPSTs gained the understanding of optimal belt fit for children in boosters and learned to elevate child posture across different booster designs. Today's speaker is Dr. Gretchen Baker with Ohio State University. I am Liz Perez, the CPS advocate for at-risk and underserved populations on the National Child Passenger Safety Board. We have planned time to answer questions at the end of the presentation, uh, so please enter your questions in the Q&A box. Just a couple of reminders before we get started. Um, attendees are requested to not participate in this webinar if you are operating a motor vehicle. The webinar will be recorded and you can listen to the recording when you safely arrive at your destination. The recording will be posted to carseyeducation.org within one to two business days. For the child passenger safety technicians in attendance, the presentation qualifies for one continuing education unit. Attendance on this webinar is required for at least 45 minutes for the CEU credit. Proof of attendance will be emailed 24 hours after the webinar. So please join me in welcoming Gretchen. Thank you. All right. So thanks for the introduction. Um, my name is Gretchen Baker and I am at the Injury Biomechanics Research Center at Ohio State University. And I'm excited to be with you all today to share some of our recent research findings um, that we've um, been sharing from some of our volunteer and sled testing studies. So just um, before we get in a brief background about myself, um, I started my undergraduate studies in mechanical engineering and got that degree at the University of Kansas. So rock talk to any fellow Jayhawks on the line. And after that, I spent a year in Gothenburg, Sweden as a Whitaker International Research Fellow at the Chalmers University of Technology. And then I started my graduate studies here at Ohio State in the Injury Biomechanics Research Center. During this time, I also completed the Child Passenger Sect safety technician certification in 2020, and then finished my master's and PhD in biomedical engineering in 2022. Since then, I have stayed on as a research scientist in the Injury Biomechanics Research Center, where I work on a variety of engineering and injury biomechanics projects, many of them through the Center for Child Injury Prevention Studies. So my background is as a mechanical engineer, but I also enjoy um, that child passenger safety technician training and getting to work with you all and with caregivers in the community. So today we're going to be talking, um, not surprisingly, about child restraint systems, which you all know are an important um, piece of the tool, um, piece of the puzzle that we use to help protect children in motor vehicle crashes. So child restraint systems really help to adapt the vehicle environment to better fit and protect children. And they do this mainly by helping to improve comfort of the children and also offering features and technologies which can adapt to the growing child and ultimately protect their more vulnerable body regions. We know that children have different anatomy and biomechanics compared to the adult population, so these CRS really help to offer that specialized protection. They also work alongside vehicle technologies. So think about the seatbelt or the airbag in your vehicle. Um, these child restraint systems really work together with these technologies to help dissipate any crash forces to reduce the injury risk to children if they're involved in a motor vehicle crash. And as you all are well aware, there are a number of types of child restraint systems that we use for children of different ages and sizes, and a lot of different manufacturers, designs, colors, and features on the market today. So typically children will start in a rear facing child restraint system, which has an inbuilt harness. And then um, we have a lot of ways to optimally attach this type of restraint to the vehicle. After a child outgrows this rear facing stage, they'll then transition to a forward facing child restraint again with that integrated five point harness. And then we attach this child restraint securely to the vehicle. And then finally, we can transition to belt positioning boosters. As you can see on these images here, there are a variety of booster designs on the market as well. Some have backs, some have 
no back, some have cup holders, different belt routing features. Um, and this is the, the type of child restraint system we're gonna focus on today. So belt positioning boosters, again, as you know, but just to refresh everyone's memory, are recommended for children who are till, still too small to obtain good fit of the seat belt in the rear seat. So this means that children anywhere between four to 12 years of age might be the right size or age to be appropriately restrained by this type of child restraint system. And the main role of boosters is to really adapt that vehicle environment to better position the shoulder and lap belts with respect to the child's anatomy. So first, they help to place the shoulder belt at the center of the clavicle or the child's collarbone. And next, they help to place the lap belt below the anterior superior iliac spine or ACES landmark on the front of the pelvis. Um, here you can see a sagittal or a side view of the child's um, pelvis bone on the right compared to the adult, and that ACES landmark, ACES landmark is pointed out. You can see that for the child, this landmark is not fully developed yet, so it's very important for boosters to help place the lap belt low on the hips and below this landmark so that we can prevent what we call submarining. Submarining is when during a crash that lap belt slides up and over the child's pelvis and starts to load their abdomen or their stomach. So placing this lap belt low below the ACEs is a really key role of boosters. So not only do these booster seats help to improve the shoulder and lap belt fit for children, they also essentially raise the child's seated height and help to centralize their position in the vehicle to help kind of normalize their posture and reduce the potential for them to assume slouched postures. So we know from previous epidemiology studies that boosters have been very effective in reducing injuries for children when they're involved in motor vehicle crashes. However, high rates of injury and fatality for children, especially in this potentially booster age range, do remain. Motor vehicle crashes still are one of the leading causes of injury death for children, both in the U.S. and globally. And when we look into these injuries a little bit more specifically, we find that the head is the most commonly injured body region, even when these children are restrained and seated in the rear seat. And prior scientific studies have identified that these head injuries are often due to the head um, coming into contact with the vehicle structure during a crash. So you can think about the seat back in front of you or the side door frame next to the child in the rear seat. And previous researchers have identified that these head contacts to the vehicle interior may be influenced by unstable pre-crash restraint scenarios. So what does that mean? That could mean that the vehicle might be making a maneuver prior to a crash. That means the child is kind of moved from its normal position with respect to the seatbelt, or maybe placing them closer to those internal vehicle structures prior to a crash or we know children move and engage in different behaviors in their rear seat normally. So this variation may also be contributing to these unstable pre-crash restraint scenarios as well. So um, I just wanna briefly uh, go over um, some of the data that I was able to work with when I was at Schaumler's University of Technology in Sweden. So we evaluated booster seated children during evasive vehicle maneuvers. So here, uh, play these videos. This is a professional driver driving on a closed test track, and we had a small sample of children that participated in the study. So they were appropriately restrained in the rear seat on a booster, and this professional driver performed different braking and steering maneuvers that are representative of what might happen prior to a crash. And we were able to visualize the children in the rear seat to assess how they moved and how they interacted with the seat belt in this rear seat to be, better understand some of these pre-crash restraint situations. So in this study, for one booster, um, you can see how it routed the shoulder belt here on the left. One booster in particular pulled the belt forward away from the torso, creating this lack of contact between the belt and the lower torso. And when children were seated on this booster during the steering maneuver, um, you'll see what happened in the middle video here. There was less interaction and engagement between the child's torso and the shoulder belt. So you can really see how they kind of slid inboard behind the belt and that shoulder belt stayed in its kind of original position. 
Now you can see the same child seated on a different booster on the right where this initial belt gap was not present. So you can watch as they move inboard in the vehicle during the steering maneuver. You can see how the belt kind of follows their shoulder and ultimately ends in a more optimal position on the shoulder. So this suggested to us that this initial belt gap might be something interesting for us to continue to explore because it might contribute to different um, pre-crash restraint scenarios, such as the shoulder belt being placed further out on the shoulder, which might not be optimal if there was a case of a subsequent crash at this point in time. However, due to the way that we collected data in these studies, it wasn't possible for us to really get into the details about measuring and quantifying this initial belt gap. So this was one of the research gaps that our um, work has focused on addressing. So in thinking about this, we also wanted to think about other ways that people, so researchers and scientists have measured belt fit for children on boosters in the field as well. And researchers and scientists have been doing this over the last uh, decades or so, and have come up with two main measurements to help us really understand, quantify and measure the fit of the shoulder and lap belt for children on booster seats. So the first measurement you'll see on the left here is shoulder belt score or SBS. Um, this is essentially, you can think of it as the lateral or side to side distance between the inboard edge of the shoulder belt and the torso midline of the child. So how far that shoulder belt is um, placed with respect to the child's midline. The next measurement is lap belt score or LBS. Um, you can think of this as essentially that vertical or up and down distance between the anterior superior iliac spine or ACES landmark that we talked about a couple slides ago and the top edge of the lap belt. So both of these measurements are used by scientists and researchers, but they're also used currently in the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety Booster Belt Fit Ratings, um, which you can find um, at this um, website address here. I would encourage you to check these out if you've never um, investigated them before. Um, it provides some, some other measurements as well, but these are two of the key measurements used by IIHS to help evaluate booster belt fit for current boosters on the US market. So since these two measurements have been introduced by IIHS and by scientists and researchers in the field, we've generally seen an improvement in the belt fit provided by boosters over the last decade or so, which is great. We've also seen scientific studies that have shown that boosters do indeed improve shoulder and lap belt fit compared to no booster conditions. However, some more recent Crash testing or sled testing studies have shown us that even if a booster provides us a similar initial shoulder belt and lap belt score, we still might see variation in terms of the specific dynamic outcomes we're seeing during these crash tests. So this is suggesting that it's not enough for us to just think about shoulder belt and lap belt score alone. There might be other aspects of belt fit or booster design that really may be contributing to these outcomes during our sled tests. So um, with that in mind, and with thinking about the evasive maneuver studies we um, detailed on the previous slides, um, we thought, okay, maybe this initial belt gap might be another interesting aspect of belt fit for us to consider when we're evaluating children or pediatric anthropomorphic test devices or crash test dummies, I'll call them ATDs. Um, so this is kind of the research gap that we were seeking to address here. So today I'm going to present a brief overview of three different studies. Um, the first one is a child volunteer study looking at belt gap. So we wanted to evaluate belt gap, belt fit and posture for children across a range of different booster designs and also compare back to our pediatric crash test dummies. And then the second study is a pediatric ATD or crash test dummy sled testing study. Again, looking at belt gap to see if there was an influence of larger or smaller belt gap in simulated frontal impact sled tests. And then finally, we'll briefly go over a second volunteer study, which started to look at more child user postures on boosters. So again, we're going to evaluate belt gap and posture for children across a variety of user postures and also compare their measurements back to pediatric ATDs as well. So um, let's start with our first child volunteer study. So for this study, we selected 10 boosters for evaluation. They were available for purchase on the US market in 2019. 
They included two three and one designs. So these transitioned from rear facing to forward facing mode and then to high back booster mode. We included two combination seats. So these two transi transition from forward facing harness mode to high back booster mode. And then we included two dedicated high back boosters, two dedicated low back boosters, and then finally two boosters, which we've categorized as other or low profile because um, their seat pans are not as tall. So they don't boost the child as much as we typically see for boosters on the market. Um, so these boosters represent a range of manufacturers and also overall designs and specific belt routing design features. All of these boosters were evaluated in a test setup, which was a vehicle seat fixture in a laboratory setting. So these are real cushions from a recent model year sedan, and then we also utilized a real um, production seat belt and retractor assembly. For this study, we recruited 50 child volunteers between four and 14 years of age, and they were each assessed on a random selection of these 10 boosters um, in this laboratory setting. And we had them sit in an upright seated posture to kind of represent a nominal kind of standard position. So for all of the children on these boosters, we performed a number of different measurements. Um, we, we had a couple of different ways to measure the posture and the belt fit of the children on these boosters. So first we utilized a 3D coordinate measurement device or a Faro arm, you can see it here in blue. Essentially, this allows us to measure or digitize three-dimensional positions on the child's body, so their anatomic landmarks, and also the position of the seat belt and the booster seats. So this gives us kind of millimeter level precision and essentially allows us to play 3D, connect the dots, and take some very specific measurements of how the children are sitting and how the seat belt fits with respect to their anatomy. We also utilized a 3D motion capture system called XSense. This is comprised of 17 inertial measurement unit sensors. So these are lightweight and wireless sensors, which allow us to measure how the child is sitting and moving over time. They're placed on the child's torso, extremities, and head, and then are used in combination with an advanced kind of computer model to provide us a lot of detailed postural information. So you can see the avatar kind of moving up here in the right corner. Um, so this avatar essentially moved and matched the child's posture throughout time. Um, so the children really enjoyed participating in this part of the study. Um, but not only that, it really provided us a depth of postural information and allowed us to capture all the joint angles and body segment orientations of these children um, at 60 samples per second. So with these measurements, we also developed a couple of novel ways or new ways to measure belt gap. So no one had really thought about measuring this potential lack of contact between the belt and the torso before. Um, so we came up with a few different ways to do that. Today, um, we'll talk about two measurements in particular. The first is gap size. So you can think of this as essentially how far away that belt is being pulled from the torso. So it's a three-dimensional distance between corresponding points on the belt and the child's torso. And then the next is gap length. So this is a length along the shoulder belt where there's no direct contact between the child's torso and the belt. So um, this was um, the ways that we were able to measure the posture and belt fit for the children in this study. So first, um, we're going to look at some of the postural outcomes, and we'll start by looking at the sagittal or side view of a child in our test setup here. So you can see an exemplary photo on the left. And on this photo, we're going to look at the position of the head top, the position of the suprasternale, so the top of the sternum or the breastbone, and then the position of the ACES landmark again on the front of the pelvis or the hips. So we can plot these positions on top of this photo just to give everyone kind of an idea of what we're looking at on this plot. And then I will remove this photo so we can see a little bit more clearly. So all of our open circles are the position of the head top, the X's are the position of the top of the sternum, and then the closed circles are the position of the ACES. And you'll notice that each um, shape or point represents a different child on a different booster, and then our different boosters are represented in a different color. So you see there's a lot more variation in the position of the head compared to the torso and then compared to the pelvis. But today I really just wanna focus in on the pelvis. So we'll zoom in here. So here on the right, we're looking at just the positions of the pelvis again in that same side view. 
So I've highlighted four of our boosters here. Um, so these are our two backlists and two or two low back and two low profile designs. And then all of our high back boosters are kind of in this grayed out cloud up here. So you'll notice that when children are seated on boosters without backs, their pelvis or their hips tend to be lower and more rearward, so closer to the back of the vehicle, which makes sense. There's no booster back here to kind of push that child forward um, with respect to the vehicle seat. We also saw some differences here in particular between our low back and our low profile designs. So if we look at our two low profile designs in the pink triangles and yellow Zs, you'll see that the Children on these two boosters had more forward positions of their pelvis compared to the traditional backless boosters in the red or the purple X's and the orange triangles. And this suggests that children may be assuming more slouch postures on these two low profile designs by shifting their pelvis or their hips forward with respect to the vehicle seat as seen in this plot. So suggesting that maybe children on these low profile designs might be assuming more slouch postures just by looking at the position of the child's hips with respect to the vehicle seat. We were also able to look at the child's pelvis in a different way um, from our X-Sense motion capture system. So here we're going to look at the orientation or the rotation of the pelvis with respect to the orientation of the booster seat angle, so the surface that they were seated on. So if you haven't thought about this before, you can probably do this with me as you're seated in your chair. Um, so if you kind of sit up straight with a neutral pelvis, you'll look like this cartoon image on the left, and we would call this a neutral pelvis orientation or tilt. Now, if you tilt your pelvis forward, almost like you're going to stand up from your chair, this would be an anterior tilt of the pelvis. So spoiler alert, none of the kids sat like this on these booster seats. Instead, they all had a posterior tilt of the pelvis. So now if instead you tilt the top of your pelvis back, like you're kind of slumping or slouching in your chair, this is the type of pelvis orientation we measured for children across these 10 different booster designs. So if we look at the average pelvis orientation across our 10 booster designs here, in our different colors, in our different bars, a more positive value means that pelvis was more posteriorly tilted, so more slouched. And again, we see some differences between our booster designs here. In particular, again, our low back and low profile boosters provided a more posterior or rearward tilted pelvis by about 13 degrees on average, which again may be indicating that children on these particular booster designs are assuming a more kind of slouched or slumped posture in their pelvis. So um, now that we have seen some of the differences by posture, let's get into our main research question for this study, um, which was to look at the belt gap. So first we're going to look at gap size. So remember how far the belt is pulled away from the torso. And we can look at the average gap size for each of our 10 boosters here and the different bars in our different colors. You'll see that we observed a variety of gap sizes, um, kind of ranging from one, one centimeter on average up to four centimeters, but in particular we identified four boosters that had larger gap sizes on average, so um, booster one, two, five, and ten here. When we look at gap length, so the length along the belt where there was no contact between the belt and the torso, you see kind of a similar trend, um, some variation, different boosters providing different gap lengths, um, but again, the same four boosters that provided larger gap size also tended to provide longer gap length. So the belt was pulled further forward from the torso and there was less contact between the belt and the torso. So we wanted to investigate what about these four boosters was really contributing to this larger gap size and length. Um, so to do that, let's look at some exemplary photos of children on these four booster designs. So these are the four boosters that provided the largest and longest amount of gap on average. And you'll see um, that gap kind of represented on the top photos here. So this lack of contact between the belt and the torso. And you'll notice that for children on these four boosters, all of these boosters have some type of design routing or design feature, which pulls that belt forward away from the torso. So either routing under a positioning clip on the blue booster here, under the armrest and this red and orange booster, or around the side wing on the pink design. Now, if we compare this to our other boosters that provided smaller and shorter amounts of gap, 
you'll see that some of these boosters do also have parts of the design that route that belt um, forward. They just do so to um, a lesser degree on these booster designs for these children. So you can see the belt is still able to kind of maintain its contact and kind of wrap around the lower torso here. There were also two boosters on the right in the yellow and teal that don't have any piece of the booster design that routes that shoulder belt near the buckle. So these contributed to the smallest and shortest amounts of gap that we measured on average. So um, let's summarize the study. We identified that ch some children assumed slouch postures on low back and low profile boosters, and this was in an effort to more comfortably bend their knees. So we observed these slouch postures by their more forward pelvis positions and more reclined pelvis tilts or orientations. And for the low back designs, this is likely due to the fact that they had longer seat lengths. And because the thighs of the children are shorter, they needed to shift their pelvis and assume the slouch posture to more comfortably bend their knees over the front edge of this booster design. But for the low profile boosters, it was kind of a different story. Since these boosters essentially don't really boost the child seated height at all, they're essentially seated directly on the vehicle seat and the same thing happens. The child's thighs are too short and they need to assume a slouch posture um, to better, um, more comfortably bend their knees over the front edge of the vehicle seat. In terms of our belt gap outcomes, we did successfully measure belt gap across a variety of booster designs and identified that different booster designs provide us different belt gap outcomes. So this was an improvement on our evasive maneuver study, which only included two booster designs, and we were able to develop some specific measurements to really measure and quantify these initial belt gap conditions. However, since this was only um, a volunteer study, we could only really assess these in a static situation. So we can say from this study, yes, we observed different belt gap metrics for different booster designs, but we can't yet say really what that means during a dynamic situation, such as a maneuver or a crash. So that summarizes our first child volunteer study. And our next logical step was to move that into a dynamic study to evaluate the effects of these initial larger versus smaller belt gap boosters in simulated frontal sled tests. So for this sled testing study, we selected booster seats for sled testing based on the results from our first volunteer study using our child belt gap measurements. So here you can see that gap length plot again. Essentially, we looked at these gap outcomes and selected um, a number of boosters for further evaluation. So we selected two high back boosters, one with a larger initial belt gap, one with a smaller initial belt gap. We selected two low back boosters, again, one with a larger and one with a smaller initial belt gap. We added in a low profile design and then additionally added uh, another low back booster, which was similar um, to this low back booster that provided a larger initial belt gap. So we had our six boosters selected for further dynamic evaluation, and then we were able to figure out what type of test we wanted to run. So we conducted a frontal crash test using the FMVSS 213 pulse. So this is the test that all child restraints have to pass to be certified for sale in the US. It's essentially a 30 mile per hour test. And then we evaluated three different pediatric crash test dummies or ATDs. So um, the Q series six year old, you can see them um, seated here on the left. We also evaluated the Q-series 10-year-old, so the kind of bigger version of this dummy. And then we also evaluated the large omnidirectional child 10-year-old, which you can see on the right here. Each of these three crash test dummies, we tested on one time on each of our six boosters for a total of 18 sled tests. You can see our exemplary test setup here on the right. Um, we used real vehicle seats, so they were mid-row captain's chairs from a recent model year minivan. And we also utilized a real seat belt and retractor assembly, which we mounted externally. However, this was a more kind of basic seat belt design, so there were no pretensioners or load limiters included here. Um, because we used this external assembly, we were able to kind of match the initial belt outlet and anchorage locations um, to be similar to those that we used in our volunteer study to help um, assess more similar initial belt fit and belt gap conditions from our first volunteer study to this dynamic study here.
So here um, you can see an example of the crash test dummies during this frontal crash test. On the left, you can see our sled acceleration pulse for all the tests, and you can see it was quite um, repeatable. Um, and in this video, you can see the ATDs moving forward and displacing um, due to this uh, sled test. So our main research question here was, was there a difference between our larger gap and our smaller gap boosters in terms of the dynamic outcomes we were able to measure from these crash test dummies during these sled tests? Um, so I'll kind of keep a little legend up here for us to keep track, but our larger gap boosters will always be represented in these more blue and green colors, and our smaller gap boosters more in the warm um, orange and red colors. So we were able to measure a lot of different things in these tests, um, and we wanted to look for obvious trends or differences between our larger versus smaller gap boosters. And even though we assessed and measured a lot of the internal ATD sensors and also external measurements, we did not find a lot of differences or obvious trends between these larger and smaller gap booster designs. So this was true in terms of resultant head acceleration, head injury criterion, forward head displacement, upper neck forces and moments, resultant chest and pelvis acceleration, forward knee displacement, and shoulder and lap belt loads. So we measured all of these things, we compared them between larger and smaller gap boosters, but there weren't any kind of obvious or consistent differences um, between these two groups of booster designs. However, we do have a couple additional measurements which describe more of how the crash test dummies rotate throughout the test, where we did start to see some differences, and I'll explain these um, a little bit more specifically. So the first is lumbar moment about the z-axis. So don't worry if you're not an engineer or if you don't think about moments or z-axis, um, we'll um, explain this a little bit more clearly. So lumbar means the lower part of the spine. So we're thinking about the spine of the crash system kind of just above the pelvis. And then the z-axis is this um, dashed yellow line here, so kind of going up and down through the center of the dummy. And when we talk about moment about the z-axis, it's kind of think about the amount of force that's rotating kind of in the direction of this yellow arrow. So if you're sitting down, um, you can think kind of about your pelvis moving and rotating left and right or your lumbar spine rotating in that direction. So we're talking about the force kind of around that rotation here. So we were able to measure this for two of our crash test dummies. So we have the LODC on the left here and the Q10 on the right. And this is the output of that sensor over time throughout the crash event. So don't get too caught up in this. Um, what I want you to notice is the difference between the larger gap boosters in the blue and solid lines and the smaller gap boosters in the dashed and colored lines. So you'll notice that our larger gap boosters tend to be on the negative side of this graph, so in this yellow region. And this is consistent with what we would call an out of belt rotation. So if you'll notice on our picture over here, the shoulder belt is routed over the right shoulder of this crash test dummy. So if you take your left hand and pretend it's a shoulder belt and place it over the right, your right shoulder, an out of belt rotation means that, that le your left shoulder is moving forward and your right shoulder is moving back. So that's the direction of the rotation for um, that we're seeing more for these larger gap boosters. You'll see for the smaller gap boosters, they go more into this blue zone or a positive rotation. So this it means that they're rotating more in the into belt direction. So again, if you use your left hand, place it on your right shoulder, that means that right shoulder is moving forward and your left shoulder is moving back. So rotating kind of into the shoulder belt. So we saw that for our larger gap boosters and the solid lines and the blue colors, more negative out of belt rotations. This suggests that maybe that initial belt gap on the lower um, side of the ATDs or the crash test dummy's torso was allowing for more rotation in that lumbar spine region before the restraint was being provided by the shoulder belt. And then we can see again a difference in our smaller gap boosters, especially for this red booster here, number two, where we saw an initial into belt rotation, um, which was a pretty different response um, than our larger gap boosters. For one crash test dummy, um, we were also able to measure kind of a similar um, type of sensor in the thoracic spine. So again, more the middle part of the spine um, where the ribs attach. Um, we were able to measure this at the first thoracic level, also the sixth and the twelfth. So again, think about that similar Z rotation. Um, so 
uh, rotating your spine kind of around this um, uh, vertical axis here. And again, you start to see some differences. Our larger gap boosters and the solid lines are providing more rotation than our smaller gap boosters. And this seems to be increasing as we go higher up on the dummy, so more superiorly towards the head. So I know that's a lot of kind of engineering words, so let's step through kind of a more visual example for two boosters um, in this sled testing study. So here we're just going to look at booster number three in the green and booster number two in the red. So these kind of represent the two extremes of what we observed. Our booster number three in the green was our larger gap booster, and then booster number two in the red was our smaller gap design. So um, what was different about these boosters initially? You can see their overall construction is somewhat similar. Um, they're both backless and you have kind of these armrests or guiding loops. So the initial difference was due to how the shoulder belt is instructed to be routed around these armrests. So our larger gap booster, the manufacturer requires the belt to be routed under this armrest. And you can see it creates this initial gap here between the belt and the lower torso. Now, if we compare this to our smaller gap booster on the right, this booster actually requires you to route the belt over the armrest, um, which contributes to this smaller initial belt gap that we see here. So really, this belt is kind of maintaining its contact all the way along the torso here. So if we look at the initial um, photos, the initial position of these crash test dummies before um, the test has occurred, you can see their overall position is pretty similar. You might see some specific differences in the routing of the shoulder belt here. Now, if we fast forward, so look 62 milliseconds into our sled test, you'll start to see some differences here. So on the left side, our larger gap booster, we're starting to see more of that left shoulder forward, so that out of belt rotation. You also see some evidence of the belt loading further out on the shoulder. And if we compare that to our smaller gap booster in the red on the right, you'll see the opposite trend, more right shoulder forward or into belt rotation here, and some evidence of the belt loading closer to the neck. Now, if we fast forward a little bit further to 85 milliseconds, this corresponds to the maximum forward head position of the crash test dummies in this test, and you'll start to really see the difference here. So on our larger gap booster, that left shoulder is kind of rotated much further in that out of belt direction compared to our smaller gap booster, which has a more symmetric forward position of the left and right shoulders. And you'll also see again on our larger gap booster, the shoulder belt loading a little bit further out on the shoulder compared to our smaller gap booster on the right side where it's closer to the neck. So if we look at a similar um, freeze frame for our crash test dummies for all of the booster designs, you can kind of appreciate that this trend um, was true um, for most of our smaller gap boosters on the top row and our larger gap boosters on the bottom row. So then the left half is our LODC crash test dummy and the right half is our Q10 crash test dummy. So on the bottom row, again, you'll see that left shoulder further forward and more evidence of the belt loading further out on the shoulder compared to our smaller gap boosters, which were more um, symmetric in terms of the shoulder position and more evidence of the belt loading closer to the neck. So um, I just threw a lot of information at you, but um, what does it mean? So we identified that larger gap boosters seem to be providing more thoracic spine rotation and also moments and forces around the lumbar spine in that z-axis. Now we didn't observe the shoulder belt completely slipping off any of the crash test semi shoulders in these tests. However, these two um, outcome differences might suggest a greater potential for slip off, especially if we consider that this crash test dummy is kind of more an ideal situation. We're assuming that they're seated in a kind of standard posture and um, they might have a different response than we would expect for a real child um, seated on a booster seat like this. However, because we only were able to assess a small amount of boosters, it's not really possible for us to kind of fully tease out the each individual effect of initial belt fit, belt gap, and other booster design parameters here. So really, um, this study is pointing to the fact that we need to continue to investigate this to really tease out these specific differences here. But 
Um, this study did show that especially looking at this lumbar moment about the z-axis is helpful for us as scientists and researchers to look at differences between different booster designs. And this also supports some previous work which has looked at a couple of other different crash test dummy designs on boosters in a similar setup. So that was um, a summary of our sled testing study, looking at the dynamic effects of smaller versus larger belt gap boosters. And then finally, I just wanted to briefly go over another volunteer study where we started to look at a greater variety of child user postures. So similar to our first study, we selected five boosters that for evaluation. These were available for purchase on the Swedish market in 2021. So these are all um, European seats, so you won't necessarily see them on the market here, but they have kind of similar overall construction and design as to boosters that we would see on the U.S. market. So again, we selected two dedicated high back boosters, two dedicated low back boosters, and also an integrated booster. So this is actually built into the rear seat of this particular vehicle and offers two different height settings depending on the child's um, stature. All of these boosters were installed in a modern compact SUV, which was parked and remained stationary in a laboratory setting for all of our measurements. And it also had a bench style rear seat, so similar to our first volunteer study. For this study, we recruited 25 child volunteers to participate. They were between four and 12 years of age, and we evaluated them each in three different user posture conditions. Um, so first, we allowed them to sit however they liked in um, on the booster, and then we had them hold an iPad or a portable tablet computer, and again, assume whichever comfortable posture they liked. And then finally, we encourage them to sit in kind of a standardized nominal posture, again, similar to our first study, so that we could begin to assess the differences and the variation in these child postures under these three different conditions. Um, so here you can see that tablet or iPad. Um, it was installed on the front seat of the, or the back of the front seat in front of the child um, for the self-selected and nominal conditions, but then for the holding device, um, we took it off and allowed the child to hold it however they wished. So similar again to our first study, we took essentially all the same measurements and all the same methods. So um, we used our ferro arm and XSense systems again to make a lot of detailed postural and belt fit measurements. Uh, but this time we saw a little bit more postural variation. So I just wanted to give you kind of a visual example before we get into some of the um, detailed data. Um, so especially for the device condition, we observed postures such as the children having more forward or flexed positions of the head. So probably not surprising. You probably assume this posture when you use an electronic device in your vehicle as well or have seen children assume this type of posture. Um, we also saw some variations in lower extremity postures such as placing feet on the vehicle seat or stretching feet to place them on the vehicle seat in front of them or kind of just generally rotating and flexing their legs. And then again, we also saw some evidence of children assuming slouch postures as well. Um, but again, we can look at some, some of these differences across booster designs. Um, so similar again to our first study, we're going to look at a sagittal or side view position Here's one exemplary child on this backless booster design. And if we add our plot on top here, um, this plot represents the average position of all children tested on this booster. So the X's represent that average position. And then the size of each of these boxes represents the standard deviation. So kind of the expected variation based on all the children we measured. So from this plot, you can see we had a greater range of head positions compared to a smaller box size, so a smaller range of positions of the pelvis, for example. So this kind of creates a little stick figure that we can um, use to kind of easily assess the posture for these children across these conditions. So first, we're going to look at the nominal conditions. So this is where we encourage the children to kind of sit standard and upright in the vehicle seat. And we can look at this posture for each of our different boosters. So again, like across left to right, booster one in the blue, two in the red, so on and so forth. And you'll see that our two high back boosters in blue and red generally provided more forward positions with respect to the vehicle seat compared to our backless and integrated designs. So 
really similar to what we saw in our first child volunteer study. And this is really due to the presence of that booster back, which kind of pushes that child more forward with respect to the vehicle seat. But we really wanted to see how different were our self-selected and device postural conditions compared back to this nominal condition. So if we look at our self-selected postures, which you can see are added on each of these graphs in yellow, um, you can see some variation, um, some larger yellow boxes, meaning the children kind of varied their posture more in this self-selected posture but we actually saw a lot of overlap between these self-selected postures and the nominal posture, um, which we were a little bit surprised about. We expected to see more variation here, but we really think this is due to this being a short duration laboratory setting so that children were really aware of being observed and participating in a study. So we would definitely expect a greater range of self-selected postures if we were measuring children, you know, driving in a kind of normal vehicle setting or for longer durations, such as uh, longer than 10 minutes. We also saw some differences in our device posture. So here you can see the device posture in the pink boxes. So this was the average position the children assumed when they were holding that electronic device. And not surprisingly, their heads were more forward and more flexed um, due to looking down at that device, which they often either held on their laps or kind of held up in their hands. Um, so we were able to measure this difference and the head was about 57 millimeters more forward on average when children were utilizing electronic devices. Um, so a couple inches more forward. And this is important for researchers and scientists to understand because then um, we can use these different positions to evaluate the implications of these more forward head positions um, through future testing, such as using sled testing, like I described earlier, or um, computer simulations. Um, and finally, just one other thing I wanted to bring to your attention here. So one of the boosters in this study um, had a lap belt positioner. Um, so again, this is a European model. Um, we're not seeing a ton of boosters in the US market with this type of lap belt positioner yet, but I know there's at least, at least one or two on the market. Um, so we wanted to measure how this lap belt positioner affected um, the position of the lap belt or the lap belt score. So we took measurements of the lap belt score, both with use, utilizing this positioner and without utilizing this positioner. Um, this ma manufacturer recommends its use, but it's not required. So you can see when the positioner was used, the score is in red, and then without the positioner, it's in blue. So the lap belt score um, improved with the positioner by about 19 millimeters on average. However, for some children, we noticed that this positioner can introduce a lot of slack or lack of contact with the pelvis. So on this top photo here, you can see um, one of those examples where this positioner really introduced this lack of contact between the child's pelvis um, and the lap belt. But on the bottom photo, you can see a more kind of optimal um, lap belt fit here when that positioner was used. So I really wanted to just bring this um, to our attention. If we start to see more of these lap belt positioners here, I think, um, you know, we always say this, but check the manufacturer instructions. So just double check um, how the manufacturer requires or recommends the use of this positioner. And I think if we see kind of a lap belt position kind of like this top photo here, that might be a flag for us to kind of think a little bit more and dig deeper into the manufacturer instructions. Some of these lap belt positioners may offer adjustable lengths or different kind of forward or rearward positions on the booster seat pan. Um, so that's where we would really want to check with the manufacturer to find the optimal length or position of these lap belt positioners um, so that we don't have this kind of slack introduced into the system. So just kind of a little um, lap belt fit um, tidbit we wanted to throw in here that we observed in this study. Um, so just to summarize, um, these, these studies were short duration and laboratory settings. So these children were aware of being observed and we would definitely expect a greater range of postures and belt fit in more naturalistic settings. Also, the study was conducted in Sweden, and there are differences in booster usage and recommendations in Sweden, um, which may affect the children's behavior and then the outcomes that we presented here. But 
um, we were able to identify that when children utilize electronic devices, this leads to more forward initial head positions, um, which may place the head forward of those booster head restraint or side wings and maybe increase how far forward they would move in the vehicle during a dynamic situation. But really, um, this is important data for us in the kind of research side of things to use in future studies to consider this typical range of child postural variation. We also hope this provides a novel data set for some common child user postures on different booster designs, which again could be useful for future testing and computer simulation efforts. So um, that summarizes our second volunteer study. And I just wanted to leave you all with a couple of closing thoughts. So um, we know that boosters are still highly effective at preventing injuries. So the goals of the research that I've really presented today are for us on the scientific and research side of things to identify continual incremental changes that we can use to continue to make child restraints and boosters even more effective and easy to use. So definitely no need to panic. We're just trying to get down into the nitty gritty of these details and identify future areas for incremental change. And I just want to remind everyone to continue um, to utilize our best practice recommendations. So having children sit in the rear seat until 13 years of age and also use a booster until the seat belt can fit properly. So usually between that eight to 12 year age range and 57 inches stature. And also just to remember good, better, best. Um, using educational tools such as the five-step test may really help us to identify when children are ready to transition from a booster seat to the seat belt alone. So with the, if the child can sit with their back fully against the vehicle seat and their knees bent at the edge of the seat without slouching, and then remembering kind of our principles of belt fit, so the lap belt being placed low on the tops of the thighs and the shoulder belt between the shoulder and the neck, and then the child is able to sit properly like this for the entire ride. And I think these are really great principles of safety that we can use to educate caregivers and children, um, not only when thinking about when a child might be ready to transition from a booster to the seat belt alone, but I think these principles are also kind of applicable for thinking about which booster might be the most appropriate for a child, especially thinking about these first two steps. Can the child sit with their back fully against the booster or vehicle seat back and their knees bent comfortably at the front edge of the booster seat pan so that hopefully we can prevent um, some of these slouch postures that we observed for some younger and smaller children on these booster designs as well. So um, I'd like to end by acknowledging all the child volunteers and their families. Um, we couldn't um, do this research without them and also our funding sources. And then I will just uh, leave you with my email if you have any specific questions and then a link um, to our um, scientific papers that I've summarized here. And um, I'm looking forward to answering any questions or any uh, future dialogue with you. Thank you. Liz, you're on mute. Thank you so much, Gretchen, for providing us with those great findings. We do have a question um, for you here. Um, it is by uh, Lonnie, by uh, Lonnie Harrison, who has a question in regards to some of the no gap boosters have the shoulder belt coming down higher on the torso, under the armpit, and higher on the rib cage. Curious if this was studied or is problematic. Great, that's a great observation and a great question. So yes, some of the smaller gap or no gap boosters um, also place that belt closer to the neck, which means that typically that belt also kind of comes off or comes down higher on the torso. Um, so we did uh, notice this. Um, we weren't able to specifically kind of tease out the individual differences in our sled testing study um, in terms of, okay, was it the difference in the initial position close to the neck or the position coming kind of under the armpit or higher on the rib cage, or because of that lack of um, initial belt gap 
since we wanted to assess kind of real boosters on the market as our first step, um, that's kind of the limitation we have with designing this kind of study. It's hard for us to tease out those specific differences. So likely it's a, a combination of all of those things. Um, but to answer that question specifically, we would need to do some more kind of specific studies where we could vary those variables individually. So either using crash test dummies or computer simulations to modify those variables individually. But great observation, and it's probably likely kind of a combination and they're all linked. Awesome. Thank you for clarifying. We appreciate it. There are no more questions unless somebody has any other question that they would like to type, type in the chat box. Um, otherwise, uh, before you go, um, we have a few closing um, announcements. We hope that you are enjoying these um, NCPSB webinar series because we enjoy having them. So thank you for, uh, for attending. We hope you will join us in January for another CEU webinar. Uh, titled Updated to UN Car Seat Regulations, What Do CPSTs Need to Know? Uh, visit cpsboard.org forward slash webinars to register, or you can scan the QR code that you see on the screen. Also, I uh, just want to go ahead and let you know that the Car Seat Basics for Law Enforcement launched September 2023. This general education course can be delivered online or in person. Any CPST or CP CPSDI may deliver the in-person training. Car Seat Basics for Law Enforcement promotes best practice in state laws, provides communication tips, and shares some information on how to access local and national resources. For more information, please visit cpsboard.org forward slash car seat dash seat dash basics dash law dash enforcement or email training at cpsboard.org. And thank you all uh, for um, uh, attending this webinar. The webinar will be posted to carseyeducation.org uh, within one to two business days. So you will be able to view the recording. For the child passenger safety technicians in attendance, the presentation qualifies for one CEU. Uh, proof of attendance will be emailed 24 hours after the webinar. Uh, remember that you must enter the webinar information into your uh, profile at cert.safekids.org to receive the CEU for recertification. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Gretchen, and have a safe day. And thank you all for all that you do to help keep child passengers and their families safe. Happy holidays to everyone. And before I stop the recording, Liz, we had a few more questions since we have a oh, couple more minutes. Sure. Yeah, let me go ahead and pull up my. Here we go. All right. Here we have some more questions, Gretchen. Uh, first question coming up. Can you describe the optimal fit at the hips? I have heard some people say that the lap belt must lie completely flat on the tops of the hips while others say that it just needs to graze the top. Yes, so um, I think I've definitely heard some of those similar questions in the field. Um, I think when we're thinking about it kind of from an engineering perspective, we want that lap belt to really engage with the pelvis during a crash. So if the lap belt is kind of completely flat on the thighs, some we've seen that some boosters kind of um, place it a little further forward and completely flat and away from the hips. And I think we would say that this is maybe not as optimal um, if there's kind of a gap, or I maybe should not say gap, a distance between um, the lap belt and the pelvis. So um, without having a specific study to kind of back that up, I would say that my engineering judgment would say, we don't want the lap belt kind of flat and too far forward. If we look at the um, lap belt score, um, metric from IIHS, you can see there's a range of kind of green, yellow, and red zones. And there's also a red zone that's too far forward on the thighs. So there's kind of a, a more optimal position that's flat, but still kind of engaged with the pelvis. Awesome. We have another question as well. What considerations did you take into account with respect to the vehicle seat back position? Um, so I'm, I'm going to assume that this 
is asking maybe about the vehicle seat back orient or recline angle. Um, and for the volunteer studies and the sled testing study, um, we used kind of the nominal angle that that seat would be um, utilized in um, a typical travel. So we did not do any studies that varied that um, recline angle, um, but that could be an interesting avenue for future research. Thank you. And just one more, Gretchen. Did different sized children fit differently, better, worse in the same seats? Mm -hmm. Great question. Um, so we did see some kind of anecdotal differences in terms of the size of children, especially for some of the smaller and younger children, assuming more of those slouch postures, which can also um, lead to differences in their belt fit. Um, because our sample size is relatively small, we did not do any kind of specific um, investigations statistically looking at age, mass, or stature. Um, but yes, anecdotally, we did see some differences. And I think that's where um, kind of using the principles of the five-step test might be a really helpful way for us to um, educate caregivers to figure out, you know, for your particular size of child and your particular um, booster, um, which kind of combination of those two things might be more optimal. Thank you so much, Gretchen. There are no more questions. And Great, again, thank, thank you. you, everyone. Thank you so much for attending. Um, thank you for joining us. And um, remember, this webinar will be available in one to two businesses days at carseyeducation.com.